Welcome to Pecan Baptist Church. Our vision and purpose is to love God, love others, introduce people to Jesus Christ, and watch them grow in the grace and knowledge of Him, helping them as they lead their friends and family to Christ. We pray that this message will bring you into a closer relationship with God and help you as you live the life He has given to you. Good morning. Well, we are going to, the plan is we're going to finish up the Lord's Prayer today. And the Lord's Prayer is an incredible study on basically, let me see if I can get this adjusted right. I've had a lot of trouble with microphones lately. Have y'all noticed? All right, let's try that. Is that better? Okay, we have been studying the Lord's Prayer. Now, Jesus said when he was going to, when he gave us the Lord's Prayer, he said, pray in this manner. And he went into detail about not praying by rote, you know, not praying by just repetition, but he also taught about praying fervently and passionately. And he said, pray in this way. And he gave us the Lord's Prayer. Now, this is in Matthew chapter 6, 9 through 13, and I want to go straight to 13 because I want to address something that happens here, and you may not know about this. In fact, Bill Hamilton taught me this years ago that a lot of times when you have different interpretations and people are looking at the manuscripts, they have to decide, well, is this in the early manuscripts or is this what's called majority text? In other words, how do you decide? Is it kind of a consensus by majority text? Or is it by early manuscripts? Now, I lean early manuscripts myself. But the Lord only knows. And how you know this, and the NASB and in a lot of the versions, a lot of the good versions, they'll often put the words in brackets. So look at verse 13. It says, do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And then in brackets it says, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, if you go to verse 13 and see the sub Number number two in my Bible, it says this clause is not found in early manuscripts. So perhaps it was added. And sometimes that happened in, in the scriptures. Sometimes a scribe added some clarification out in, the, out in the column or something. Okay, and then eventually it got added to the scriptures. Now, was this in the scriptures? Well, if you talk to some theologians, they'll say, oh, yes, it was, because they interpret by majority text. You talk to others, they say, no, it was probably added because, and they're early manuscript people. Okay, now, do we know if that was actually said by Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount? We really don't. We just really don't. This verse right here, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Was there a problem with that text? No, it's accurate. It's good. But when you get to heaven, with, along with a lot of questions we have for God, maybe that's one of the questions. When you gave us the Lord's Prayer, did you add these script, Did you add that scripture at the end? Yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. He's the one who actually knows. Now, there's nothing wrong with it. But like I said, I tend to lean toward early manuscript myself when I see these things. And so today we're going to stop. I'm going to stop when, on the Lord's Prayer at do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That's where I'm going to stop today, and we're going to cover that scripture. Now, as always, as you've probably seen, there's a lot more to it than what it first appears. Have you noticed that about the Lord's Prayer? At first, I mean, you know, perhaps I had to memorize this in confirmation class when I grew up. I grew up Lutheran, and I just knew the words. I didn't think a lot about it. But when you start getting into it, it's much deeper. In fact, when you see the Lord's Prayer for really what it is, it's kind of a summation of all of Jesus' teaching from basically the Sermon on the Mount all the way to the Olivet Discourse. It includes everything, and it is so much deeper than at first glance, as always is the Word of God. Would you say that? You guys should be amen in that. That was too long of an intro. I've already lost you. Okay, so Jesus in the beginning says, pray then in this way, in verse 9, our Father who is in heaven, and it starts with our, I'm going to give you a quick summary, not so quick summary, but it starts with our, and that our is very important because that our is the community of believers, it is the family of God, and we are part of that family, and that community or that group is the most important group that you will ever be involved in that you will ever be a part of. It's more important than being an American, 
It's more important than being Texan. It's even more important than being a Texas Aggie. It is. It is the most important group that you will ever, ever belong to, and that is the family of God. It is foremost. It is primary, right? And sometimes, guys, we don't live like it. We don't live like that is the most important group that we belong to. And so it starts off with our. You know, and human beings have this built-in sense of belonging. We want to belong to something. Well, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you do belong. It is the most important club you could ever be a part of, the most important family, community. Why is it that important? Because it has eternal implications. It lasts forever. Look to your neighbor. If they're a believer, you're going to spend eternity with them too. Does that change your mind? (laughs) If there are certain things you don't like about your neighbor, don't worry, right? All sin is going to be gone at that point, right? We're going to love everybody equally. And so God is awesome. I promise you, this is very important. Our Father. And then our Father. Everything. Everything in our lives should revolve around our Father. It should revolve around God. God is first. He is foremost. He is the creator and sustainer of all things. And so he should be first and foremost in our thoughts in our actions, in our lives, everything we do. It's very important. That is how God calls us to live. That is having the mind of Christ, the mind of Christ. And here Christ is telling us, our Father. It's first. It is first. Our Father who is in heaven. Positional awareness. You know, it's good to remind human beings. It's good to remind us. That God is God, and we are not, right? We are not God. We are a part of the creation. God created us. We are made in his image, but we are not God. He is the potter, and we are the clay. So now he can do whatever he wants with his creation and however he chooses to do it inside his will. And he gives us great freedom inside of that framework of his will to exercise and to do things, and he wants us to glorify him and keep him first inside of our own lives with the freedom that we have. Now, look here. Hallowed be your name. Now, wait a minute. We haven't even talked about any circumstances or asking for anything yet, provision or health or finances, anything like that. Hallowed be your name. Before anything happens, no matter what circumstances, hallowed be your name. So no matter what is happening in your life, whether you're struggling whether you're going through a great time of blessing, whether you're going through a great time of hardship, it, doesn't, it does matter, but it doesn't matter as far as your praise goes. See, in here, in the beginning of the Lord's Prayer, hallowed be your name. Praise the Lord. Never, ever is a Christian ever in a position where the Lord does not deserve praise. And that's just the truth. Even if our life is terrible, the Lord still deserves all the praise and all the glory. Why? Because of eternity, because of what Christ did. We're always in a position of great praise. And I've said this once and I've said it a dozen times. There's no place for a woe is me Christian. We live in a constant state of celebration. This period of time is also the Sabbath day's rest. That was a fulfillment that's taking place here. Why? Because we are Resting from the law. We do not have to fulfill the law. Christ fulfilled the law, and so we live in the Sabbath rest. The kingdom of heaven is a picture. It's symbolic of the Sabbath rest. So we praise the Lord. We give him all the glory because we don't have to earn our way there. Man, so many people just can't grasp grace and don't have an understanding for what God has done. They would think it was more understandable if he had to do something or accomplish something or live to some standard. God made it to where there was only one way, and that is his son, the only begotten, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Now, that is not what the world is teaching. The world is teaching there's multiple pathways, but there is only one, and it is by grace, not by works, lest any should boast. 
So hallowed be the name of the Lord God. Hallowed be the name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. But Lord, what about my will? We haven't even got to my will yet. Now, Lord, your will be done. And what is the Lord's will? To grow the kingdom of heaven. He is not willing that any should perish. He wants people to come to Christ. He wants people to accept the free gift of grace. And so in this prayer, guys, if we're praying this prayer with the very heart of God, if we're praying that prayer with God's heart before anything involving ourselves or our circumstances, we're concerned about souls. That's first. Why? Well, your soul is secure. If you know the Lord Jesus, your soul is secure. You are in Christ for all eternity. Well, what about those who aren't? Jesus said, look up, the fields are white unto harvest. He looked down upon Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I have longed to gather you as a chick gathers her, as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. How he had a heart for the lost and still does. Do we have the heart of God? Your kingdom come, your will be done before my circumstances, before my needs, before anything involving me, your will be done. Your kingdom come. The Lord's prayer is incredible. On earth as it is in heaven. That's, the, that's another thing I want to point out to you is that this is not the eternal state. I mean, you can know that certainly by your declining health, right? We start dying the moment we're born. Nobody amen that either. You guys are... Well, that's really not a good amen, but a lot of people are feeling it. Amen, right? So on earth as it is in heaven, this is not the eternal state. God is going to bring about justice and righteousness on the earth. So there is a limited amount of time. So not only do we care about the souls, right? Your kingdom come, your will be done. We care about the souls. We want to bring about the Lord's kingdom and see more and more people saved. And we're doing VBS this week. Pray about that. If you're not serving or able to serve, you're out of town, you can still pray about VBS. Pray about that. There's some little, little child, all the little kids are going to learn about God, but there may be some child that makes a decision for Christ, even at a young age. The youngest one in my family that ever came to Christ was Lily. Lori, was she six? I think she was six years old when she accepted the Lord. That's young, but Jesus said, let the little children come unto me. See, that's what really, really matters. It's so easy in this world to get distracted by news, by materialism, by politics, whatever the case. Do you think that's on purpose, that we have so many distractions? Stay focused on what really is important. Our Father, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The time is coming. When Jesus comes back, the time will be up for people to make their decision. The rapture of the church that happens before the 70th week, after the rapture of the church, if you haven't made a decision to follow Christ and you're not a believer and the rapture were to happen tomorrow, you are going to be required to as much as possible, to live through the most difficult time that's ever existed on the face of the earth. And we studied the book of Revelation. I do not want to live through that time. I'm looking forward to the bride going home to the groom, the rapture of the church, which I believe is the sixth seal. There's a time coming. You know, we also looked at the great white throne judgment when all the unbelievers are raised up and they come before the great white throne. There's two books examined when they come before the great white throne. One is the book of actions and one is the Lamb's book of life. And it says right there in the scriptures of Revelation, it says that anyone whose name was not written in the Lamb's book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So in other words, the book of actions, there's nobody that made it by their own actions or by their own works. The only way to make it is by the Lamb's book of life. And we know people. See, if we're distracted, maybe we don't live like Christ when our circumstances aren't too good. 
Maybe we don't glorify him. Maybe not hallowed be your name in a time of great difficulty when that could have an impact on somebody around us who isn't a believer. We have to stay focused. The Lord's Prayer is perfect. It is perfect at keeping our focus where it belongs, keeping our focus on God. Then in verse 11, it says, give us this day our daily bread. Finally, we get to something. Finally, we get to something we want, right? Well, this is bread. It has two meanings, right? Bread is kind of a, a meager thing. It's not a buffet, right? It's, it's kind of a meager ask. Give us provision, but also the bread has another meaning. Jesus said he is the true bread. Give us the true bread that came down out of heaven. The disciples said, he must have food to eat we know not of. And Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but up by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God when he was tempted by Satan. So the, the meaning of bread is much deeper than just that. Jesus is the bread of life. Then in verse 12, I never realized this till a couple of weeks ago when I was praying about this and studying this scripture. It says, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And Peter asked about basically this. He said, well, how often should we forgive someone who does something wrong to us? Seven times? And Jesus said, 490 times is sufficient. That's not what he meant by 490 times. He meant over and over and over. And this scripture to me, I never realized it, is about grace. Because that forgiveness, that requirement to forgive is ridiculous. In other words, an infinite number of times we have to forgive somebody that wrongs us. Over and over and over we have to forgive them. Why would he put that requirement on us? Because that is what God has done for us. Have you wronged God more than 490 times? Think about it. Any time in our lives we put something else before God, 490,000 times, 5 million times, it's without number. So what he's saying here is, look, he is requiring us to forgive like he forgave us. And so it's, in a, it's this understanding of this unbounding unbounding limits of grace that's the depths of the oceans and the heights of the stars where does this grace come from well the previous verse says give us this day our daily bread it's perfect it's just perfect the word of God Jesus Christ he after all these years of studying his word he just continues to blow my mind now, in verse 13, it says, And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And so oftentimes, this verse, there's been a lot of debate about it. Perhaps this verse is very much misunderstood. I don't think it is. I think this is exactly what Jesus was trying to say. Now, there's a problem with this verse. Let's go look at James, because is there an apparent contradiction? I'll tell you ahead of time, there's not. But you knew that already, right? James chapter 1, starting in verse 12. Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. Now, what does the scripture say over here that Jesus said in the Lord's Prayer? Do not lead us into temptation. Now, we can go look at the scriptures and we can see that God doesn't actually tempt anybody, but he does allow them to be tempted. So what this is really saying here, this is talking about the sovereignty of God. See, God is sovereign even over evil. And so what that means for us is the world is not spiraling out of control. God is allowing these things to happen, to bring about his will, his kingdom. Have you ever prayed on earth as it is in heaven? Bring about your righteousness. Bring about your judgment on earth as it is in heaven. That's what he's doing. He's going to bring it about. Don't lose your focus. Get frustrated. Focus on the wrong things. Focus on Christ. 
So do not lead us into temptation. Now look at this, look at this verse. James is not saying, look at, James can't be saying that God will not allow anybody to be tempted. That's not what he's saying. Look at James chapter 1, starting in verse 2. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect results so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Now, there's a lot to do. We could, I could teach a whole message just on those verses right there. But consider it all joy when you go through various trials. I don't know about you, but sometimes I struggle with that. Nobody amens that either. I had a couple head nods. When you go through trials or difficulties, a time of testing, that can be a, it can be a struggle. That's why it's a trial or a test. Does anybody in here have test anxiety? Yes. Well, the Lord brings about testing for us, and the testing grows us. It strengthens us. That's what the testing does. So now also, look what it says. Consider it all joy. How could we consider that joy? Well, if we have the mind of God, the mind of Christ, then we understand that this is temporal, and even our suffering and our trials will serve a purpose. Do you see that? They serve a purpose. And even when they serve a purpose, we always know that they're temporary because of what Christ did for us. So consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result. We can fight against it, right? We can fight against the will of God for our lives, and the will of God for our lives isn't always pleasant, unlike a lot of preachers will tell you today in this, in this age, this age of tickling ears. The will of God may not always be pleasant for you. Think of your children did they always like the medicine you tried to give them? Did they like to go to the doctor and get their shots that were good for them? No, but sometimes we have to do things that are unpleasant, but always know it serves a purpose. So do not lead into temptation. I think of the story of Job. Remember the story of Job, that Satan comes before God and requests permission to torment Job, basically. So what this scripture also means to me is that God is sovereign over evil. Do you see what it says? Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So God has authority over evil. It can, he can do what he will. And you may ask, maybe you're a person that hasn't been here very long, you may ask, well, why then did God allow evil? Because of love. And love requires a choice. So there had to be a choice in order for there to be love. So God is sovereign over evil, and God will bring evil to an end. We know that in the eternal state. And so know that God, Satan, is not sovereign. God is sovereign. You know, our government is not sovereign. God is sovereign. And guess what, guys? You are not sovereign. You're not. Man, how many times in my young life, not even so young life, I felt like I was trying to hold everything together. I was trying to hold my family together. I was trying to hold my career together. And then when we planted this church, I was trying to hold this place together. And you know why that is so stressful? Because we're not sovereign. That's why it's stressful, because we're trying to control something that we can't control. Instead, what we're supposed to do is trust God. God is the one. He's the creator and sustainer of all things. Trust God to hold things together. There's a huge difference. So first of all, in this scripture, we see that we are not sovereign. Give us this day our daily bread. Your kingdom come, your will be done, right? Lead us not into temptation. Lord, I don't need your help. I can resist temptation. 
why are you guys laughing at me? Right? We, we don't have that kind of strength. God promises us that he will not allow us to be tempted beyond our own ability. But if he left us open, how strong do you think you would really be? I mean, think about it. We are not sovereign. God is sovereign. God is sovereign. Lead us not into temptation. We're not sovereign. We're vulnerable. That's what we are. And we're not sovereign. We're not holding everything together. I've said before, control, control is a fallacy. It's a fallacy. God is the only one that has control. You want to do the best thing you can do for your career? Pray. Put God first. You want the best thing you can do for your family? Pray and put God first. And when things go crazy, which they will, they always do, trust Christ, praise his name, teach, be an example in a time of chaos if things like that go about because of free will. But glorify Christ no matter what. God is sovereign. We're not sovereign. Take a deep breath. Take a deep, you don't have to hold everything together. Man, that was so revelatory for me because I really tried to hold this whole thing together, this whole church together. And then I realized one day, that's stupid. That's dumb. God is the only one who control has that type of control, and he will do whatever he wills. What do I do? I do whatever I can in the sphere of influence that I have. I'm called to pray and preach. That's what I do. So, guys, the same thing for you. Take a deep breath. Stop trying to control everything. You're not in control. God is in control. Also, take a deep breath that Satan is not in control. He's a roaring lion looking about for whom he may destroy. And you will not come under attack from Satan that is not allowed by God. Allowed and limited. Allowed and limited. With the promise that God will use it for good. Now, I don't know about you, but that makes it all better, doesn't it? We don't even have to fear it. Because it's allowed, limited, and God will use it for good. If we let him. Man, that's awesome. I love, I tell you, the sovereignty of God. When we really start wrapping our arms around the sovereignty of God, just like when we try to wrap our arms around grace and we really start understanding grace, there's no room for unforgiveness in our hearts anymore if we truly had an understanding of grace. And just like that, if we truly understood the sovereignty of God to its full extent, it would be a relief from stress and anxiety in many ways. There's something else that's going on here that Jesus points out in this last verse. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That basically we are in a war. This is not a time of peace. Right? There is a battle between good and evil. And we're on the playing field, believe it or not. And we're not even the ones in control. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We are in a war. And what is Jesus doing here at this time? He is praying. He's praying about it. The most powerful thing we can do is pray. Because we are in a spiritual war. Turn now to Matthew chapter 4, a couple pages back from our primary text. So I thought this was going to be a short message, and it, it's just, I tell you, the Word of God is amazing. Jesus here is tempted, and look at what it says. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit. Now remember, just a couple pages over in the Bible, it says, do not lead us into temptation, what here happened to Jesus? Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights. He then became hungry, and the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones become bread. Now, isn't that fitting also, thinking of that? But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, 
He will command his angels concerning you. So now, this is Psalm 91. Satan is quoting scripture against him. On their hands they will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, on the other hand, what? So in other words, what you said is correct. On the other hand, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, go, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and began to minister to him. Guys, that is what victory looks like. Did Jesus look victorious? He was probably laying there nearly dead. But he was victorious. Why was he victorious? Because he was testing And he stood strong in the midst of testing. Now, how did he do it? By prayer and by the word. That's how he did it. So, guys, we can too. We we have been gifted the Holy Spirit and the promise that we'll never be tested beyond our own ability to resist. God limits it. Not anybody here could take this testing. I promise you that. One of us would have failed these tests. Every one of us would have failed these tests. One of us would have failed these tests. Well, it's me. Yeah, I would have. Everybody would fail the test that Jesus. He was tempted and tested beyond our own spiritual strength to resist. But God promises the Christian that we will not be tempted beyond our own ability. So what that means is we can win. We can win the battle that's placed before us. We're not victims. We're promised victory. Win the battle. Stand strong. Do not fall for temptation. Stand strong. In the middle of it all, whatever the trials may look like, glorify him. Hallowed be your name. Live your life on purpose for Christ. Stand strong. We we are winning this thing, and we will win. I've read the end of the book. If you haven't read the end of the book, I'll give you a summary after the service is over. But we win because Christ won. We win because we trusted him. But guys, don't we want to, on the way, on the way to that ultimate victory, don't we want to win here too? Don't we want to win our little battles that God puts before us like Christ won the huge one of going to the cross? Don't we want to win and be victorious here when God puts various trials in front of us? Stand strong. And guys, I promise you this, trust God no matter what. No matter what conditions or circumstances stand in front of you, trust God. Don't be distracted by all the garbage. Don't be distracted by all that garbage. Keep God first. Stand strong and win the fight. Finish the race that God has set before you. Thank you for listening today. If you'd like to learn more about the ministries of Pecan Baptist Church, go to our website, at www.pecan.church or call 682-205-1565. We're located in Granbury, Texas. Services are each Sunday at 10 a.m.